before I get into my topic of taxes and going through the presentation, there's there's stuff in there I've touched in the past and something that's just not. It, it's there and it's, it'll be informative, but I want to be sensitive to everyone's time too. So we're a little bit behind. So you want to kind of group vote here? You want to talk about taxes or you want to kind of go with, go with Paul and the sales training and the sales overview, just to be sensitive with time. Um, is there a preference or? Ta taxes? Okay. <laughs> we'll we'll go through it. We'll go through it quick. I mean, it's it. We'll cruise through it. Um, and if you have questions, stop because if take it as an opportunity to get free tax advice or free legal advice from Paul, because Paul will jump in and ask questions. And and kind of the the. The topic I went through is addressing the changes in the tax landscape for growing companies is what was on the flyer as we presented. So the first part is, hey, what's your entity of choice? And most of you are all established companies, but S-Corps, LLCs, are there any C-Corps in the group? C-Corp. Why is C-Corp? I curious. I don't mind putting you on the spot. It was liability at the time. Okay. They were walking through escorts uh, quite a bit at that time. This is you know, 30 years ago. Yeah. And that's why we did it. It's a long established company. It's a accident. It's a you know, $10 million accident. Yeah. It's a wipeout and all. Yeah, I, yeah, with a partnership or a sole proprietorship, um, it does give you more liability protection, correct? Versus probably the S corp probably these days probably gives you about the same. Yep. Your limited liability companies and your limited liability partnerships will give you the same. The biggest thing is how do you run it? Are you commingling your personal assets with the business assets or not? Um, so that that personal liability is one thing in choice of entity. We are running the other company that we just started that is we're a union contractor because we travel all over the country, New York City, Boston, whatever. Yeah. Uh, we have recently, in the last 12 months, started a non-union company primarily to compete here in the southeast. Okay. And it is an LLC. That's good. As a subsidiary of the C Corp? Uh, no. Separately and owned? And that's Different. A standalone. Oh. See. There you Actually, go. different owners. Because of the union contracts that are in place, you can't run you know, different offices, different warehousing, different everything. Okay. They have to be kept separate. So, so those are some good points on your choice of entity and why you want to do it, and whether you want to keep it under your existing entity or you want to put it in a different entity, and what is that? And the LLC gives you the flexibility of different owners, special allocations, where your C corp and your S corp are more stringent and less flexible. Um, or if you're just coming to the country and you want to start a business, what's the best entity to start? It's probably an LLC because you can't, you can't be an S-Corp because you're not a U.S. citizen at that point. So there's things that go into it. Um, C-Corps can have unlimited shareholders. S-Corps have limited shareholders up to 100. you got some family, family rules that get together, but there's other things that go in line. Um, what's your exit plan? C-Corps? You know, private equity investors like C corps because they're very structured. S corps not so much, and LLCs not so. The, the LLC preference, but they like the the rigidness of certain entities. So it's all what your plan is. I guess the biggest takeaway from a growing business I want to make is start off small and flexible, whether it's a sole proprietorship or a single member LLC. And as you grow, you can make you can be an S corporation or you can be a C corporation. You convert very easily to those. When you go C to S, it can be costly. There's, there's a tax impact to that. So when you want to make that C Corp election, or if you want to be a C Corp, make sure you're doing it for the right reasons. Um, the Congress is getting ready to come out with a new tax plan. Yeah, you see, you, see some, you see Trump pass something. I, I thought about talking about that, but I mean, is the reality, yeah, yeah it is, but it, it's all outlined. So well, my question go ahead. Is, there's a lot of S Corps out there. Yeah. And you know, it's a, just a pass-through of income right. all the way to the individual owner. But if, if he is successful in lowering the tax to 20%, like you said he's going to do, yeah. for instance, 
do you see a lot of conversion from <coughs> exports back to city court? Possibly. If you look into it, it depends what type of business you're in. Attorney, CPA, professional services, consultants, a lot of that wouldn't apply because it's all pastor and it's professional service. So it depends what type of business you are. Uh, construction, construction, consulting, depends. And then how is that all affect from a pastor standpoint where it says, okay, it's not 20% on the income retained in the company. So if you're a pastor entity and you make $100,000 and okay, that's all gonna hit your 1040, where you can get the taxes to pay, <coughs> you gotta get a distribution out of the company and help you pay it. So is that distribution then gonna be taxed at the highest rate or is it gonna be? So it gets into the details of it. His plans are very, and I talked about this in a previous presentation, they're very high level. There's nothing in the details of how it's going to go through. So that's why, why I'm hesitant to talk about it and give advice to clients until something at least gets before the legislature and the rules because there's a lot of details of it missing. So if he gets it passed, well, I'd like to see a, at least the details of it and how, how those certain things would work with pastors and things like that. So there's so. a chance it could still be retro to this year? The later and later it gets in the year, the less and less likely that would be. About the biggest thing would probably be the depreciation and bonus depreciation and section 179 limits and where you can write off assets right away in the year you acquire them. They've already kind of set expectations that it's going to be next year. That's yeah. Impressive. Yeah. So if you were looking at a nasty tax liability this year, what's your best shot? Depends on what you have going on, depending on, and if it's you, it's probably bonuses. Um, bonus everything out, take prepaid, about, depends if your cash or cruel. Take a lot more cruel. Yeah, so your so bonuses, you could. So take the bonuses and pay the yeah. smaller tax, pay the smaller yeah. personal tax and pay the corporate plus the state. It depends on the individuals and the owners, and yeah. Still nasty. And, and even if, if for the shareholders, that would have to be paid by the end of the year. You couldn't accrue it, then pay it later, like you could with your employees, where you would have right. at least until March 15th, if you're a county, you're in to pay that bonus. So you get it for um, Another option is probably a profit sharing plan. If you want to bonus that, and sometimes that gives you some leeway and saying, okay, you don't have to make that contribution until you actually file a return. So that may be an option depending on how your plan is set up. Maybe. Large piece of equipment, I'm allowed 500,000, is that correct? Correct. Up. One time. One time. And then you have bonus depreciation too, which is still at 50%. It goes down to 40% 40, 40 next year. Have you taken on new clients, by the way? Yeah. <laughs> Always. Um, we kind of touched on this right now, the compensation and benefits a little bit, and setting on bonuses. That's one way to get deductions and accelerate. One way how you can reward your employees as well. Um, you got your qualified pension plans, your non-qualified pension plans, and this is where you're probably getting creative too with deferred comp and things like that. Stock options as well. Do you want to give stock options to your key employees, or do you want to make fa phantom stock plans so you can reward them that way? So there's a lot of things you can do to get creative with compensation. Kind of with the theme of everything, it's how do you want to reward people as they go forward? And then you can invest it over time. And say, okay, you, you put a five-year plan together and this is how you're gonna invest in ownership. And share that information with them along the way. Get them excited about joining and contributing <coughs> to the company. Now it's all on personalities and what do they want? Do they want that? Put it out there and see what, see what happens. Um, this is probably came up recently with the Section 23B elections with stock option, came up with a client, he was getting options. It's an interesting um, election where if you get an option, you can pay the tax today and get the upside as capital gains going later. Because usually options, when you get them, it's all ordinary income. So say if you get a startup, Mac approaches me and said, hey, I got this startup. I'm going to give you stock options. What's the value of the company? Nothing. It's pre-revenue. But I, hey, if you get it to $10 million, I'll give you 50% on an option. So if I pay the tax today at a zero value, I pay no tax because the value is nothing but I have an option because I made an 83B election. But come, I get to the $10 million number, the company's worth $10 million. 
and Max said, I'll give you 50%. Okay, now I got a $5 million gain. But it's, and I exercise the option, but it's all capital gain at that point. So I got the spread, between, if I waited and I didn't make the 83 b election, I'd have to pay ordinary income tax on the five million. So you got a spread between 20% and 39.6. So just food for thought. And if you get approached by, for options to invest in a company, it's one way to go about it. Um, accounting methods, and this is kind of one way you can adjust your tax liability is changing accounting methods. Are you cash accrual? How's your inventory? Are you using 263A? What are you doing? Um, or is there able to defer revenue? Are there certain defer deferral revenues you can do? Can you, um, percentage of completion, complete contracts, probably a big part. Are you following the right methods? Or is it between residential and commercial? You can have two different methods that way. So there's certain things you can do. You just gotta look at your business and see how you're operating and affect it. Um, <coughs> Depreciation is always a low-hanging fruit with tax planning. Um, I share this example with you. I had a sh new client came in, lost losses, losses over the years, but he's paying $50,000 in mortgage interest and another $30,000 in real estate taxes. He lost all that benefit because the AGI was negative, and those are personal expenses. So he has no benefit for those deductions. If he would have picked up at least well, fifty, eighty thousand dollars of income, he could have sheltered that income that way. So sometimes <coughs> losses are good, but if you're leaving deductions on the table, you maybe put too many. See, there's too many losses out there. So you got to plan, plan accordingly, and maybe it's depreciation, something you can accelerate, and decelerate. So it's, it's the low-hanging fruit. So you can take, you can take a five-year asset and spread it over ten if you want, in a straight line. Um, I kind of touched on it a little bit, utilization of losses, your passive losses through um, S-Corps or capital losses or your net operating losses from a C-Corp, how are you utilizing them? Um, are you using them at, in a low income year or a high income year? i rather have my clients save those losses for years where they're going to be in the, at least the highest tax brackets, the 39.6 or 30 or higher versus, hey, only the 20 because it's 15, because they're not getting the most bang for their buck. It's not as tax efficient. Um, there's credits here. I'm not going to get to it too much. Um, there's employment credits out there, so research and development in solar. The employment credits are mainly for targeted groups, people on welfare and, and military, and have been unemployed for a long time. Deductions, here's things we can think about. Um, and as a growing company, hey, how, you're starting a company, you're starting, what would you do with your startup expenses? Do you expense them or do you capitalize them? Are you capturing everything as you're going through? So then this next part is just kind of give you a couple of ideas of deductions that we're looking at. Um, domestic production activity deduction is more if you're manufacturing, growing, um, growing something in construction, not, not manufacturing with the, the dog treats and putting that together. Not so much from a retailer consulting standpoint. The lab may be pushing it from, because you're not creating something, you're bringing something and putting it back. You, there's a 20% change there. So certain, but that's a good deduction if, you, if you're able. This one I always have to remind clients about meals and entertainment. You, you, we, go out, we go out to lunch. I, I pay, I deduct it, it's limited to 50%. That's meals and entertainment. Hey, if you take all your employees out for a firm picnic or a Christmas party, it's all employees are included. That's 100% deductible. So if you, you may want to carve that out that way. Or if you're, you know, you're stocking, stocking soda and water in the refrigerator, all employees are contributing to that. That should be 100% deductible. So those things are important and that can add up, um, especially if you're generous with your Christmas party. How this case, uh, David, yeah. this case you told about the dog food program, we, this is open for every employee. Can yeah. we consider this uh, material that you gave to them for us? To, uh, it would be a benefit. The cost would still be income to them. So if you gave it to them, they would receive a benefit at cost. But I think if I understood you correctly, they're, they're paying for it at cost. 
So it's a net zero. It's a net zero to you. I'm not giving away. Yeah. yeah I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. Good try. I'm sorry. So you are getting better. Than that. Yeah, you sell it to them. Now, if you gave them a discount less, like 10% less cost, then okay, then then you would have a loss out of it because you're paying more than you're getting in. Just and I think this happens with all business, probably at any stages. Personal assets are converted to business use. Make sure you're capturing those and putting them in there. You buy a car, you use it. Uh, there may be some liability concerns if you have a car and you're using it for business purposes. We are selling cars, but we are paying the merchant credit card company and we are paying royalties. So we pay 7%. Yeah. We buy for one for 100, we, we, we sell for 100, but in fact we are paying 7 yeah. No, it's okay, but so you, you the, 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 yeah, the it's already yeah. right, but I'm not charging them the yeah, credit card. Right, but they run the credit yeah, cards right. and, and they pay well. Yeah. So I run the sales. Yeah, as an so officer. it's a small loss, but you're. Yeah, 7% yeah. yeah. is a lot of it. It's a bag of money yeah. on the table. Well, it's appreciation <laughs> for the employees. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, other deductions, um, Doug touched on this a little bit for health insurance with the level funding is a good one. Um, where you get the refund at the end if you don't use all the credit, or if you don't use all your claims and you don't have to use the reinsurance, as a way for the, the employer to get a refund of their insurance, health insurance back. Um, partners and LLCs and 2% greater shareholders and S-Corps have to watch their benefits a little bit and make sure it's included in the income because um, it's not treated as other employees. You're treated as more of the non-employees for those benefits, so the limitations change a little bit, where you can't participate in HSAs, um, and your health insurance deduction should be included in your W-2 as income. But you get a deduction on your personal return to offset that, so a little just compliance issues there. Um, communication expense, uh, is just tel telephone, make sure you're capturing those. The Teslas, anyone have a Tesla? No? We got two on order. Do you? It's interesting from a standard deduction standpoint, because the IRS hasn't updated for, for the standard mileage. So you can take your standard mileage deduction on the Tesla at 53 cents a mile when they haven't updated it yet. So your cost on a Tesla is very low wow. than 53 cents. So it could add up greatly part of the business. What about size of trucks versus you know, depreciation instead of five years? Like you know, most of my trucks are scrapped in three years. And what I'm using now says it's a five-year depreciation. Depends what you're using, like semi-tractor trailers or yeah, three, like three, four, you know, one-ton trucks. But they still have a six thousand pound limit too. Yeah, but he's more talking about the principal life. That that's for 179 deduction, where you can get the accelerated, get the 25,000. Yeah. Accelerated anything over six thousand. Yeah, yeah. And most years are probably considered work trucks, which would be over the 6,000 pounds. Yeah, absolutely. So, they'd be accelerated too. So. How much? Is that 50% is that of the purchase price at that point? Yeah, after you get through the 179. And then you take the 179 and it's five years. So after, basically after. Five years after that or can I accelerate that depreciation? Generally like I, said, like, like I said, we were on a ton of miles. By the end of the day, I'm buying diesel trucks. And, then for three years, I'm ready to get rid of them. I've got 250 on them, 275 on them. The only thing I, are you falling in that special purpose vehicle where you may get three? You may get three. From an electrical truck and those things. I can't get it through the trip, which is why you can talk to um, sales tax, that may be more, well, you know, make sure if your sales tax is included in your income, make sure you're getting a deduction for it. That's, um, de minimis amounts for capitalization. Uh, changed, the IRS changed the rules a couple years ago, the tangible asset regulations, where now you can just expense anything under $2,500. You don't have to capitalize it. So it's kind of streamlines the capitalization and what you have to do. <coughs> Downside from Florida's standpoint is, the county's not going to like that. They're still going to want you to report that on your tangible property return. So it's a balancing between the two. So uh, if you're going into multiple jurisdictions, some things to think about, your, the sales and use tax, the income tax, compliance issues. I think you mentioned you were, you were going in a foreign country. Um, IC discs kind of come up where if you're manufacturing, you get an arbitrage play in the tax rates. 
So there's certain, and what compliance issues are you opening up going in that country and foreign tax credits do you have coming back? Um, yeah, we filed um, 23 or 24 returns this past year. States, federal states. and states? Yeah. yeah. So the... Of course, a good many of those states are based off of federal. You know, it's, it's almost a, you know, percentage of the federal. Yeah. It, it almost bang, bang, bang. Yeah. California's not, Arizona's not. There's, you know, New York gets a little squirrely. Yeah. But also, pretty much straight off the bat. Yeah. You get the, the apportionment factors, and are they sales only apportionment? Are they sales, property, and payroll apportionment? And so, the states can get that. 2008 through about 2014 was terrible, so I had a tremendous amount of lost carryover. But yeah, but that gets to. Yeah, but that, I mean, that's still important, I guess. Even if you're going to mergers and acquisitions, make sure you're still filing those states because it becomes up a due diligence issue if you're not filing it. And, it. and if those loss issues come up, you want to still file in those states if you're going to continue to file because you want to capture those losses for when you do have income. And clients usually, when they're in a downturn, don't like filing in more states because their compliance fee goes up. But it should be to their benefit if they continue to make money in those states. Yeah. So, yeah, some clients pay, play the state tax lottery. Well, hey, we're not going to file in those states. We'll wait till the state comes in. My recommendation, you should file. Uh, I don't want to file. Okay. But you're, they're taking risk if the, or if the state agency comes back and says, hey, you haven't filed. They've never started the statute of limitations. The state can go back as far as they want, even if it's 20 years if they want. Most of them don't and probably cap it at 10, but they do have the option. Um, Mergers and uh, kind of skip. It's asset sales and stock sales, and when you do stock for stocks, appreciable assets, things change between different so stock and asset and your tax attributes, NOL and accounting methods and prepaid things like that will all change. Um, it's just a whoops, sorry. Quick example of an asset sale where you usually a new owners will start a new co. You got the current over here is the current company and they switch all the assets here. They contribute, the new owners contribute the money. The money goes over the company and the new owners, just kind of a graphic for you guys to see it. And same thing with the stock transaction. Stocks over here, cash goes over, but the company doesn't change anything. So nothing in the current company changes. You don't get a step up in basis. You don't change, reset the depreciation. Um, the NOLs are still there. They may be limited, but certain things are, stay the same. Um, this was an article I saw recently, so I thought I'd put it up here. And most common, common client, most common client questions, and I've gotten all of those um, regularly. Probably the least one I get is, "What's the effect of this tax transaction?" Um, maybe, maybe not less. Maybe that's not the best way to put it. It's the most surprising one of the of the the two, of all of them, because. I could have helped the client structure it differently or do something differently or save them taxes. But if they come in and say, meet with them after year end and go, hey, I just did, hey, I sold 50% of the assets of my company. Here, here's the agreement. I can't do much for that. Here's the purchase price allocation. It's already set. I, I, it's already set and done. I can't help them at that point. So that's probably when it stands out to me the most and happens. I don't say it happens more, but it probably stands out. Uh, to help it a lot, but not in my case, right? Yeah. Remember that? Yeah. We were working together with my lawyer to develop yeah. it for the and then, it saved a lot of money. Yeah. So I recommend David. Me too. <laughs> I did whatever they said. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, and as I think is probably for generation baby boomers get older, it's how does that wealth transfer? Okay, is your IRA, what's going to be the effect of that to the next generation? And there's certain things that go into play there and trust comes up. Um, sorry I sped through that, but any questions? Any? No? You're good?